Hi, my name is Riva Verma. Today I'll be talking about the role of innate immunity in cancer. And by the end of this video, uh, this presentation, I hope to leave you with a better understanding of uh, what immunity is, what are the different types of immunity, and how our body is able to regulate its response in case of cancer development in our body. So uh, a brief overview of what we are going to go through today. First of all, like I said, uh, the basic definition of immunity, type of immunity, and the antigen-antibody interaction, which elicits an immune response in our body. Next, we would move on to the structure and function of our immune system and the different kinds of immune response that are generated. Um, Moving on to the next part, which is uh, the cellular immunity, the role of different immune cells, wherein I bring the part uh, the the work that I did as a PhD student in NUS. Uh, I'll be talking about my project work for half of the presentation um, duration of this presentation, followed by immunotherapy, uh, which is basically development of treatment strategies for cancer. So immunity uh, is, in layman terms, is the resistance exhibited by the host towards an injury or, a, or, a, or the invasion by a foreign body or a microorganism and their products. So immunity serves to protect us against infectious diseases that come from the outside, for example, a bacteria or a virus. But it also distinguishes self from non-self components, which is... Um, a uh, self component, for example, is a cell of your body, but non-self is a, is a cell of a foreign body, which does not belong to you and to serve uh, and serves to eliminate uh, potentially destructive foreign substances from our body, thus making sure that we are healthy and safe. Now, there are two main kinds of immunity, which is innate immunity and acquired immunity. Now, as the name suggests, innate immunity is something which is innate to the to the host to the body which is due to a virtue of the genetic and constitutional makeup on the other hand acquired immunity is something which is acquired or adapted during life um yeah the 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 definition of the two is quite clear from the names itself now innate immunity is can be considered to be the borderline defense. So it's the first row of soldiers guarding our borders, which is the border uh, between our body on one side and the infection or the pathogen on the other side. So it provides early defense response against microbes, against any foreign invasion. While acquired immunity is very specific, it is the expert army that you uh, invite when the innate immunity sort of has has a sense of the situation. Now, the acquired immunity which comes in is highly specific and sophisticated and innate immunity is non-specific. So initially, because our body does not know what sort of threat we are dealing with, therefore the response is quite non-specific. But by the time acquired immunity, the acquired immune cells come into play, they already have a decent idea of what we are dealing with. Therefore, the response is very specific. Innate response does not change on repeated exposure. The innate immune cells would respond in the same way, even if a similar virus is, you know, being um, is attacking our body again and again. But acquired immunity learns. Therefore, we say that it has a memory function. It remembers that this virus has been, you know, our body has been exposed to this virus before. Therefore, we must better our response. And this can be improved by immunization, which is a development of vaccines, while innate immunity is not affected by immunization or any prior contact with the pathogen or the virus bacteria. Innate immunity in terms is dependent, is basically of three types, or we can say is, uh, is a results in, has three different levels. So the species immunity is the is the immune uh, factors which are present in the entire species. For example, the entire species of humans, which is Homo, Homo sapiens, is um, has this um, resistance or has immunity to react in case of uh, any bacteria. For example, let's say um, or virus. Let's say chickenpox virus. So the entire species is able to elicit an immune response against this. Uh, the, the immunosufficient individuals, of course. 
and therefore this is known as a species immunity now racial immunity is where the race gets involved or the region gets involved for example if we consider uh, how indians would respond to a particular infection and how chinese would respond to a particular infection the response can be very different in fact uh, the current crisis that we are facing for example covid-19 we already have seen that there are racial differences in the way people are responding one race or one region can be more prone or is better at uh, surviving the disease than the other so these factors contribute to the racial innate immunity now individual is at the individual level uh, let's say me and my friend have been brought up in different households different surroundings different conditions therefore we both have different kinds of immunity different factors immunity the way i would respond to a certain certain infection might not be the same way my friend would therefore these are the uh, differences this contributes to the difference in innate immunity exhibited by different individuals within a race now uh, there are thousands and thousands of uh, possible um, particles or bacteria virus which can enter our body therefore it's impossible for our body to recognize every single one of them right so therefore what our body does is that it has these receptors as uh, you can see here it has these receptors which are called pathogen recognition receptors so basically it is a protein structure it's a glycoprotein structure open uh, on the on the mem cell membrane and the bacteria or the virus has something called pathogen associated molecular patterns now the the pathogen might be different but the pathogen associated molecular patterns the pattern also known as pamps are similar so our receptors are specialized are able to detect these patterns and therefore once these two interact and bind immune response gets activated the cells on which the receptors are expressed decide what to do next with these should they engulf them should it lead to phagocytosis or should they alert other immune cells which are present in the body that uh, okay we have detected this foreign invasion into our body now decide let's decide what to do next right so it detects the pattern it does not detect a particular antigen moving on to the more specialized the sophisticated arm of our immune system which is adaptive or acquired immunity is a specific protective immunity which occurs as a result of previous infection or immunization and is conditioned by the previous experience so that it is able to respond adequately and sufficiently to prevent or treat infection now because this form of immunity develops as a response to infection and is acquired during the lifetime this is called uh, adaptive or acquired immunity and like i said it is very specific because it has specialized surface receptors or molecules which are able to uh, recognize able to study the threat the target and are able to uh, elicit a specific response and since they also have memory function they remember uh, what what sort of molecule or what sort of pathogen have been interacted with before therefore they remember and are able to respond more vigorously to the same microbe the next time uh and now there are two different kinds of adaptive immunity which is active immunity or passive immunity now active immunity like you know the name suggests is actively produced by the host immune system the host immune system our immune system is actively involved in active immunity while passive immunity is something which has been received for example introduction of ready made antibodies into our body if uh, let's say our body is unable to, if our body is able to produce antibodies we would call it active immunity and if we are receiving uh synthesized antibodies it is called passive immunity and uh in the first case active immunity there's an active involvement of our immune system while passive immunity there is no participation it is simply receiving those antibodies and for active immunity because our body will take time to 
to recognize the uh, the foreign particle and it will take time to generate a specific you know the antibody which is able to specifically target these these this molecule this threat there's a lag period there's a time then we don't have those antibodies and then we do but for passive immunity we have those in our body the moment we are injected or transferred those and active immunity because it's a more dynamic process our body is constantly uh, learning constantly getting better at understanding the threat so therefore there's an immuno immunological memory present it remembers and it's constantly shaping its response but passive immunity it's uh, it stays as it is the uh, it the antibodies come into our body no matter how the threat is evolving or changing the um, immunity the immune response remains the same so there's no immunological memory associated with this now there's um, active immunity is further of two times two uh, two types natural and artificial um so natural active immunity is for example uh, we let's say a person has been infected with chickenpox so the body would produce antibodies against those so your body is actively involved therefore it's active immunity but it's also a natural because you did not force your body the the infection came in on its own you did not force your body to produce those antibodies therefore it's called a natural active immunity on the other hand artificial active immunity is uh, when the resistance the antibodies are produced by injection of vaccines now vaccines are basically um, a non functional form of a virus or um any microorganism in a, in a it, it can be killed it can be modified it can be a, a product of those organisms so what happens is basically they give it in a dose in which your body does not develop the disease but is able to produce the antibodies required to prevent the disease so your body is artificially made immune to the particular infection so therefore this is called artificial active immunity and vaccines fall under this uh, category so for example now <laughs> vaccines is you know every every other article every other news uh, item discusses vaccines because it is the need of the uh, to come up with a vaccine for covid-19 so uh, just to bring in some context here what the vaccine would do is to produce um, antibodies is to force your body to artificially produce antibodies so that in case the actual coronavirus covid-19 wants to enter your body already has what it needs to you know to to attack the virus to not let it grow and you know take over your your body or fail your immune system so uh, uh like we said there's innate immunity there's adaptive immunity innate immunity is a rapid response a non specific rapid response at the border adaptive immunity is slow and is very specialized so there are different cells different immune cells which are responsible for carrying out these functions now innate immunity primarily has macrophages natural killer cells dendritic cells uh, neutrophils and so on adaptive immunity has more specialized cells like b cells so the antibodies we talk about come from b cells which are also known as plasma cells in some case and the most effective the most potent cells in our body which of the adaptive immune system which are able to kill uh, cancer cells or or any other cells which have gone bad are called t cells now t cells um, and natural killer cells so t cells from adaptive and natural killer cells from uh, innate immunity are the two most specialized cells which in the context of cancer are uh, very very helpful in in uh, eliminating cancer from our body and uh i will be talking about these in uh, in the end the data parts of the presentation so a very very general overview of uh, our immune system so we have stem cells which are basically cells which are uh, capable of giving rise to different kinds of cells and they split into two which is common myeloid progenitor which leads to which gives rise to cells of innate immunity 
and common lymphoid progenitor which gives rise to cells of acquired immunity. So at this point we learn that innate immunity has myeloid derived cells while acquired immunity has lymphoid derived cells. Uh, so these are different categorizations what our cells are and once they get activated what sort of cells they turn into uh, we, we wouldn't need to go into so much detail but uh, this is just for your general uh, understanding okay moving on to uh, antigens so till now i have been saying that it's a foreign pathogen or a foreign particle or a foreign molecule which comes into your body but the right term to define it is an antigen an antigen is a foreign substance which when introduced into our body stimulates the production of an antibody with which the antibody from your which is inside our body will react with the antigen as you can see the antibody the glycoprotein structure interacts with the antigen and once it forms an antigen antibody complex it is able to destroy the um, prevent the um, um, when the antigen or the antigen related components from developing and growing further in our body so technically antigen uh, antibodies are specific glycoprotein configurations which are produced by b cells or plasma cells in response to a specific antigen so because antibodies are a part of adaptive immunity they are specific and are capable of reacting with that particular antigen so this is what we call an antigen antibody complex antigen and antibody um, together yeah Okay, now uh, bringing in some more context here for cancer. So cancer itself, the cancer cells themselves are an antigen, but they can also produce more antigens. For example, your cancer cells would have certain receptors. They would produce certain proteins, which are which your body is able to identify as um, it's not foreign because um the cancer cells are also your body cells but it is able to identify them as uh, components where something has gone wrong for example there's overproduction of a particular molecule or the cells are replicating growing at a very fast pace so your immune system is able to identify it it is able to recognize that okay these th there is something coming from these cells which is unusual so therefore it is able to recognize those antigens and alert the immune system the other cells of the immune system that okay this is happening in our body it's time to fight it now so tumor antigen is an antigenic substance which is produced in tumor cells and triggers an immune response in the host and uh, these are actually um very useful from uh from a from a medical point of view because these tumor so for example if you want to there's blood testing being done to detect certain cancers so in the blood you cannot detect cancer cells per se because the number of cancer cells in your blood are too few and you need a very high precision to detect those therefore what they do is they detect these proteins they detect these tumor markers to in order to identify if a person has cancer or not and these are used in diagnostic tests and are also potential candidates for use in cancer therapy once we know that these cancer cells are producing this xyz factor we know how to we know what is happening inside the body we know how to deal with it and these factors that are produced by uh, the cancer cells are called tumor derived factors and sometimes also called tumor derived suppressor factors because they try to suppress the immune system so this is just a brief uh, uh, overview of what kind of anti antigens there are some some are tumor associated which can be more general or tumor specific antigens which are specific to the particular type of tumor and obviously these are ideal for detection because if we know that this specific tumor antigen is associated to this specific kind of cancer the detection diagnosis is much better then we look at uh, the type of target tumor specificity how is the tolerance of the body and uh, how prevalent is it in different patients because the thing with cancer as we know is that 
no two people having even the same type of cancer would have the similar uh, similar response they would not have similar similar a uh, phenotype or the heterogeneity of the cancer even the cells could be very different even in two patients which have similar kind of cancer this is the most uh, troublesome feature of cancer and this is the reason why cancer therapy which works for one person might not work for the other person and it is also the biggest bottleneck in uh, detection development of successful cancer uh, cure and therapies now this is where it gets interesting cancer immunotherapy so uh, for a long time scientists have been trying to modify the cancer cells so the cancer cells come uh, they grow in our body and they sort of take control over our system so what scientists used to focus on was to stop the cancer cells from growing but what we have realized later is that cancer cells grow because they suppress the immune system so recently in the last two decades or so there has been more effort on trying to activate the immune system so what we want to do is that the immune system that has been suppressed we would activate it further we would rekindle the immune system so that it is able to kill the cancer cells basically we would provide the the cells the defenders the the soldiers with more weapons with more armor so that they can kill the cancer cells successfully and eliminate it from our body this can be done in a number of ways which i'll discuss in the following slides so basically we are asking our immune system making our immune system to kill the cancer cells and this is an example of um, artificial active immunity as i discussed in the introduction so um, this is to show how an immune response is active is initiated against cancer these are the different type of cells dc is dendritic cells macrophages nk cells gamma delta cells nk t cells and these on the other side are tumor cells so you see there's a lot of interaction between our immune system and tumor cells so what we want to do is we want to train our tumor cell uh, train our immune cells to to screen these cells uh, the to separate the cancer cells from the healthy cells as you can see in the cartoon down below uh the t cell which is the immune cell is sort of screening through the cells to see uh, to, so the cancer cells they are able to separate the cancer cells from the healthy cells so therefore it's a very dynamic process and um, what we want to do is train these immune cells so that they are able to better uh, kill the tumor cells and uh, they don't let them grow so that they cannot take over and establish a tumor in our body now what is interesting and this is where my uh, expertise comes in is that the boundary of innate and adaptive immunity has been sort of diminishing because if you remember correctly i sh i showed this um the same picture before but what we know now is that these are not all the cells and the the definition of innate immunity and adaptive immunity is slowly evolving is rapidly changing so we know these three different types of cells ilc1 2 and 3 which are innate lymphoid cells have come into existence so innate means myeloid but then these are lymphoid so they are belonging to the innate immune system they elicit a non specific response but they are of lymphoid origin so they sort of lie in between you know at junction of the two arms of innate, innate immunity and uh, my team we were interested in studying the role of these cells now these cells depend on two main transcription factors called tbet and eoms i'll be using these names a lot in the next few slides so i wanted to give a brief uh, introduction to what these are now these are transcription factors so transcription factors are basically protein uh, molecules which um, regulate transcription in our cells or transcription which is the process of um, conversion of dna into rna so basically these helps in the process of um, in in they have a regulatory function in making sure that our body is able to make proteins from dna 
right? Transcription and translation. So transcription is DNA to RNA and translation is RNA to protein. So these help to regulate that um, the function, the DNA is able to convert into a protein so that our body, our cells can function as usual. So these two are very similar in their function and structure. They have a common DNA binding T box domain, which is why um, these are put together in the same family of T box proteins. Now, the function of uh, these innate lymphoid cells, specifically ILC1, has been unknown for a while. So these were first identified in a uh, first recognized as an individual cell in 2010 studies before that did see some anomalies some unusual cell types which were present but they were not recognized to be an, a completely independent cell type till 2010 and their functions in different organs has been studied for example this particular paper which studied the role of um, ILC ones in the thymus, they see that these cells express all these receptors and how they differ from the conventional cells in the spleen. Similarly, liver ILC ones were identified like that. So they also compare the cells from the liver to thymus and splenic NK cells, natural killer cells, which were later known to be ILC ones. Similar results were seen for salivary glands for your uh, uterus and we found that okay these it looks like these cells are really different from the conventional natural killer cells and they do not really fit into any of the previously known definitions so we uh, so the scientists sort of um, made this unanimous decision to consider this a separate class of immune cells and suggesting that they do not bear similarity i mean they do bear similarity but they do not fit into the definition of any prior known immune cells so this is the, the the purpose of my project so we know that the function of ilc ones in all these different organs has been studied and it has been studied under different conditions infection and um, different kinds of infection or homeostasis but what we don't know is the role of lung ilc ones in cancer so therefore this became the um, this became my research uh, area and I focused on identifying these cells first in human as well as using mice models and I tried to figure out what is the role of these cells in lung cancer and metastasis. Now metastasis is the spread of cancer from one primary site to a secondary site. Now, because cancer cells are not limited to just one area, so let's say a tumor forms in the liver, the cells over there continue to grow and proliferate, which is replicate, grow in numbers, and they form a primary tumor. So after a while, the tumor would be so big that the cells would invade into the bloodstream or the lymph vessels. So this is this process is called intravasation so they enter into the bloodstream and these cancer cells start to travel they disseminate in the bloodstream and eventually extravasate into a secondary site for example could be your lung could be your brain could be any other organ so they extravasate and once they reach another site and the environment is favorable they would start to colonize that secondary site as well they would form micrometastasis which is a small number of cells which could then because the cells are so rapidly growing they would form macroscopic metastasis which is basically a secondary tumor and metastasis it's only after this process has happened that the diagnosis is usually made the detection prior to metastasis is very rare due to lack of symptoms and the fact that it is detected so late is what makes it responsible for approximately 90% of cancer related deaths and these cancer cells basically keep you know you, you might question so much is happening inside the body why is our immune system not responding this is because the cancer cells are very clever they produce immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment factors which is basically in the tumor they produce factors 
immunosuppressive factors which suppress your immune system and they are able to escape immune detection and continue to grow in the background without you know our immune system being alerted it is only very late when the um meet when the um um when the cells are when the cancer cells are detected and uh, their growth is stopped sorry okay yeah so moving on to um cancer immunotherapy so therefore because cancer cells are so clever and are able to really you know suppress our immune system and hide from our immune system we need a therapy we need a treatment for cancer and in this case we call it cancer immunotherapy now cancer immunotherapy is of different types but the ones that i am interested in is adoptive immunotherapy which is basically because if a person has cancer the immune cells are not functioning well so we want another we want we we inject the person or we give give the person healthier immune cells which could be from a healthy patient or could be genetically modified and we transfer those cells into the body after growing them outside and we transfer and we then uh tell the, the tell our body to start uh you know fighting against those cancer cells so that it's 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 again giving artificial immunity to the body and this is known as cancer immunotherapy so the main purpose of my study is to see if these ilc ones in the lung like i mentioned can be used for cancer immunotherapy do they have the potential to you know to be transferred into the body and then um, to kill cancer eliminate cancer successfully now this is the paper which uh, i have recently published and uh, this uh, is this has most of the work which i'll be talking about and uh, although it has been accepted it is still uh, in under production uh, they are the, the frontiers immunology team is going through the typesetting and all the formalities so it might take about a week or two for it to be available online but uh, in case you guys have any question any um, any clarifications needed please, please feel free to ask me or to reach out of, for a copy of this paper and i would be more than happy to share it so okay this brings me to the objectives and aims of my study now the like i said the first aim of my study is to uh, identify the role of crop 1 ilcs and cancer metastasis and immunosurveillance and this is how we were able to do it so for the first aim we characterize and phenotype the function of human group 1 ilcs and metastasis based on the expression of tbet and eoms which are the two transcription factors in ilc ones like i said next we take the study from our hum take the results from our human studies and transfer it to mouse study and we see how um, how the results are uh, how uh, what sort of factors are similar between human and mouse and what all can be translated to mouse studies and we carry out the functional studies in mouse which is our aim to be and third we carry out ex vivo co culture experiments which is basically um, so we have studied in human we have studied in mouse now we study in a lab setting to see how these cells are how what sort of properties do they have and are they fit for applications in adoptive cancer immunotherapy so uh, this is the the first aim which was to characterize the function and phenotype in humans we um, got patient blood which is nsclc non small cell lung carcinoma blood across different stages stage 1 2 3 and 4 from um, the national university hospital in singapore we collaborated with a lung surgeon and an oncologist and we were able to get these blood samples so we got a 5 ml fresh blood and we carried out flow cytometry to determine to study the different subsets of cells present in the blood and how they varied across different stages so uh, this is the flow chart basically explaining what we did uh, so after i after the blood was collected by the nurse and the research staff on that side i collected the blood sample i 
did FICOL density centrifugation to separate the PBMCs, which is um, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. And after getting the PBMCs, I stained the cells with antibodies so that I am able to detect the cells that I'm interested in using flow cytometry. So flow cytometry is a major um, component of my study. So flow cytometry basically um, is able to is able to separate the population of cells based on the uh, the 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 color or the frequency of fluorescent antibodies which are attached to the cells. So um, right. So the reason why we I started out with NSCLC or lung cancer is because lung cancer is one of the treatable cancers because it can be detected. Uh, it cannot sorry it's not one of the treatable cancers because it is not detected early on therefore it accounts for a larger fraction of uh, death due to cancer so as you can see after so lung cancer is the most uh, cause of you know, highest cause of death is lung cancer followed by colorectal uh, breast cancer and prostate cancer so it's more than the next three cancers combined so therefore there's a need to detect since the detection is so difficult, there's a need to develop an effective strategy for the treatment of cancer. And uh, as you can see, the cancer, the death due to lung cancer in this uh, in this uh, bar graph, it is much more than the other three combined, which is uh, very scary. So now there's different types of lung cancers out of which, uh, okay, so the, the major two types are NSCLC, which is non-small cell lung cancer and SCLC, which is small cell lung cancer. But NSCLC comp comprises 85% of the lung cancer cases. So naturally, we focused on this type of cancer and these further have different types, which is squamous, adenocarcinoma and large cell cancer. Now, for the purpose of our study, we have looked at non-small cell lung cancer patients, which also, which comprises of these three types, squamous adenocarcinoma and large cell cancer. But as you can see, adenocarcinoma is the majority, is the most prevalent form of NSCLC. And that is what we observed to most of the patient samples, especially in Singapore, we got for adenocarcinoma, which means that uh, this is really the, I think, for, for us, it was around 80%. 80% of the NSCLC patients that we got were adenocarcinoma. So therefore, uh, we focused on non-small cell lung cancer patients because its incidence is the highest and uh, it is uh, currently being treated by surgery um, and a combination of chemo and radiotherapy. But surgery so there's uh, stage one two three and four stage one and two patients are subjected to surgery however stage three and four the if the cancer has progressed too much there's too little that can be done by surgical intervention so for stage three and four chemotherapy is the current um you know routine protocol however you can see that stage one and two the survival is still 55 percent uh, sorry 40 percent and above however stage three and four is where it starts to get very tricky the survival for stage four is less than one percent and it is stage three and four is when it is detected so therefore stage three and four where metastasis has already happened is what we want to target because we already know that it is the survival is very low therefore we need to come up with a strategy to make sure that cancer can be treated even after the cells have metastasized now this is the uh, this is how we collected the patient it was we uh, unidentified the patient uh, names there was no uh, personal data involved and uh, we coll collated information regarding their initials their race their gender and uh, we took consent from the patients and everything was done in uh, accordance with the institutional review board uh, recommendations and we also we looked at the st staging using the tnm staging which we got from the pathologist so t is tumor N is node, M is metastasis. So, so based on this TNM staging, we know how far the tumor has spread. So if there's a tumor, then you have T. 
has it reached any lymph node any nearby lymph node is under n and m is has it metastasized to any other tissue so you can see stage 3 and so the stage information is um, over here so you can see stage 1 and 2 have tumor or node but the stage 3 and 4 onwards have metastasis has happened already so this is how um, we use flow cytometry to identify uh, the different cell populations so different cells based on their size and granularity would show up in different areas and uh, Basically, just a very brief uh, uh, idea of how flow cytometry marks works and how you would see different populations. I wouldn't go into the details because flow cytometry it's in itself is a huge, huge field. So just for the people who are familiar, um, this is how it works. So what we saw is that pre-metastasis. So if you look at the figure A. In, when we look at the frequency of group 1 ILCs, we did not see any difference between stage 1 and 2. However, we noticed that the, the EOMS MFI or the amount of EOMS protein present between stage 1 and between stage 1 and 2 and stage 3 and 4 reduced. So therefore, as the cancer progressed, EOMS protein in these cells dropped, which means that EOMS could have a potential protective function because EOMS has gone down and the cancer has become worse. So therefore, there's a correlation between the two levels. And for TBET, we observed the opposite. We observed that TBET increased during cancer pro uh, progression. So during metastasis, there was more TBET, less EOMS. And we also looked at the percentage of EOMS negative cells and we saw that um, number of EOMS negative cells increased with cancer. So therefore, EOMS is going down and cancer is getting worse. So we, you know, the, the correlation is there. We do the causation in the mice studies and we find that EOMS has a protective function against cancer. So if we are able to increase the amount of EOMS in these cells, they would be able to better protect against the cancer. Right. So we see that there's an increase in EOMS negative cell number with cancer product progression and there's a decrease in EOMS MFI with uh, metastasis. So stage 3 and 4 has less EOMS compared to stage 1 and 2. So this is what we found in for our AIM-1 which is group 1 ILCs or ILC1s have reduced EOMS and from when the cancer grows, when the cancer cells start replicating faster there's an increase in the number of uh, uh, cancer cells in the patient blood we see an increase in eoms negative tbet positive cells right so next we moved on to the mouse studies because we saw this interesting observation in humans so we were wondering if the similar phenomena is happening in the mouse also and if it is how can we you know, how, we perf how can we use this to our benefit? How can we increase EOMS so that we are able to develop immunotherapy for treatment of cancer? So here, what we do is we inject cancer cells into the mice through the tail vein. So the cell line that I worked with is called B16 F10 uh, metastatic cell lines. So we inject, so I injected it into the tail vein and the cells reach and colonize the lungs. So the metastasis forms at the lungs in this case. And once that is done, at different time points, I took out the lungs, I processed the tissue, isolated cells from them, stained with different antibodies which are specific to ILC1s and ran the cells under flow cytometer to see how, um, what sort of cells are present in the murine lungs. And I also uh, carried out ex vivo experiments. So basically, um, you isolate these. So flow cytometry is detection of cells, but there's also flow sorting, which is isolation of cells from the tissue. So we are also able to isolate these cells and study them in a lab setting. So uh, this is how I established cancer. So your non-treated is the mock, which is the healthy mice. And the ones that have cancer are, are injected and then the lungs are harvested at day 7, day 14, day 21. Harvesting basically means that um, 
you take out the lung you take out the tissue process the tissue isolate the cells from them now the pictures here speak for themselves p16 f10 cells produced melanin therefore the tumor is visible on the surface of the cells so you can see mock there's no tumor day 7 there are some some very small microscopic metastasis of, uh, visible but by day 14 and day 21 it is already grown so much and um, nodules are very clearly visible and this is macroscopic quantification now to microscopically quantify we did rt pcr which is real time polymerase chain reaction or quantitative pcr in which we measure the mrna level the mrna transcripts of uh, these particular uh, genes coding for melanin therefore we saw that the two genes are melanin a and pmel and we saw that the levels increased post meta post injection therefore uh we know that the cancer cells have successfully metastasized and are replicating therefore increasing the level of melanin in these tissue now flow cytometry through flow cytometry we identified that we have the if you look inside the boxes and the frequency we see that eoms low or the eoms negative cells at day 0 was 6.31% but at day 14 when the cancer cells grew the eoms negative cells increased to 15 percent which is an almost 2.5 times change in the frequency and we also looked at absolute cell numbers and we see that there's an almost five or ten times increase in the number of eoms low cells during cancer which means again that as cancer is progressing eoms low cells or eoms lacking cells are growing which tells us that maybe cancer cells are doing something to to reduce eoms level in these cells it is not letting the eoms high cells to grow because it doesn't want it knows that eoms high cells might be more capable of killing it so the cancer cells are strategizing in a way that only eoms low cells are able to grow now so therefore we observe that pulmonary or lung group 1 irg subsets increased with metastatic progression and we also notice similar phenomena in the spleen now cytokine production cytokines are basically essential proteins which are produced by our immune cells and serve a variety of functions so for the purpose of our study we looked at uh, the first panel is interferon gamma and the second is tnf alpha so uh, we see here we measure the level of interferon gamma and tnf alpha produced by these two cells and we saw that eoms low cells the ones which are increasing are less functional they produce less interferon gamma compared to the eoms high cells so therefore what we speculated all this time that eoms high cells are better at killing cancer and therefore they are being reduced could be true eoms low cells are not as active not as potent as eoms high therefore their production their proliferation is being promoted the cancer cells wants them to grow because they are less effective at eliminating cancer and we also measure the cytotoxicity how well are eoms low and eoms high cells being able to kill cancer cells and what we saw is again in accordance with our hypothesis which is that eoms low cells are not able to kill uh, cancer cells so but eoms high cells are able to successfully kill cancer cells as you can see the middle bar graph over here and the third one is the eoms low and first is b16 alone which is the control so we can see eoms high are better at killing therefore cancer cells do not want them to grow so they are producing something which is preventing eoms high cells from growing and eoms low cells is being upregulated so we also had subsequent questions regarding the source of these cells which is uh, a bit uh, uh, digressing from the topic currently so i wouldn't go into the details i would just briefly touch upon it we wondered whether these cells are being transformed from since we saw an increase we don't know if these are replicating on site or are these converting from eoms high to eoms low but what we saw is that they are not converting these these cells are 
independently replicating on their own and they have uh, and they have um, uh, they are a bona fide ILC ones and they're able to grow and uh, grow and replicate on their own they are not arising from EMS high cells right so the sorry I got cut off uh, previously so I will start this slide again um, so for the aim two, so far we saw that um, group one ILCs are present in the lung and increase um, and there's an increase in EOMS low cells, which means that as cancer progresses, EOMS low, which is uh, less amount of EOMS is present in these cells, which prompted us to check whether increase of EOMS could help to prevent cancer. The second aim was that EOMS low cells are increasing with increase in metastasis, which is um, uh, as shown in this box over here. Third is that EOMS low has less cytotoxicity, has less potential to kill cancer cells, is producing less cytokines. Therefore, it is not as effective in killing cancer as EOMS high, thus, uh, high, thus making us hypothesize that EOMS low cells could be um, a way of cancer cells to escape immune detection. Now, third, we saw that EOMS low cells are, sorry, fourth, we saw that EOMS low cells are uh, bona fide IOCs and they are not transconverted from another type of cells. Moving on to aim uh, three, which I'm going to be very brief about because I think I'm running out of time, is that we tried to, like I said, see how EOMS is contributing to control of cancer. So what we did is we overexpressed. First of all, we studied the interaction of cancer cells and immune cells ex vivo, which is um, in outside the body of the mouse. So in a Petri dish, basically. And we overexpressed EOMS in this immune cell. So we forced these cells to express more EOMS to see how they would kill cancer cells. So this is the whole setup, which I think I won't uh, go into the detail but you can see look at this part EOMS is increased in these cells through uh, this transgene and what we saw is that um, EOMS levels were increased so as you can see this is sketch YG is the is the um, NK immune cell line and the ones which had EOMS were had more cancer cell death so we did notice that overexpression of EOMS is able to increase the function of NK cells. So thus, uh, you know, proving, thus showing the causation that if we increase EOMS levels in the immune cells, we can get better control over uh, cancer. These are just some biochemical assays to show that we did achieve overexpression of EOMS in these cell lines. So therefore, the summary we get from this is that overexpression of TBET led to increased cytotoxicity of cancer cells. So this is how we conclude the or put together the whole study, which is um, there is this is the metastatic side where the black is the cancer cells, brown is EOMS. Uh, high and orange is EOMS low. We see that with progression of cancer, there's an increase in cancer cells, obviously. There's an increase in the orange cells, which is the ones which have low EOMS. And because of this, there is a reduced cancer cell death. There's no proliferation of cancer cells. And these orange cells, which is EOMS low, have less killing potential, have less cytokine production, and are not as responsive to cytokine stimulation. Therefore, we hypothesize that this is the reason, EOMS reduction is the reason that we are losing control over cancer cells in this setting. And from an immunotherapeutic point of view, increase of EOMS or augmentation of EOMS levels in these cells would eventually lead to increase in apoptosis, which is increased killing of cancer cells and slowing down their proliferation so that we have better control over cancer and our immune system is able to uh, eliminate cancer successfully. Now there are few study, few uh, perspective, future perspectives which are left, uh, which uh, I think uh, maybe I'll just touch upon the last point, which is important because um, th at this point we just know that these ILC ones, this is what they're doing in the lung, but RNA sequencing to analyze the full developmental profile and function, how these cells are developed, what other functions do they have? 
is also a very um, essential and a very important study which can be done in the future to study the role of these cells. Now, this is my team uh, here at NUS, and I would just uh, briefly like to acknowledge my supervisor, Prof. Ding Jitling, and the entire team for making this study possible and for their help and contribution throughout. And I'm very thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity, to the audience here. Uh, and I hope that um, you were able to learn the to understand what is the role of immunity in cancer and how um, uh, our immune system is always on alert, always trying to prevent us from uh, getting infections. Same is the case with COVID-19 also, which uh, I'm sure the, the, the scare that all of you are going through right now. So therefore, in general, it is important to keep our immunity um, strong, to practice healthy, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle to opt for healthy lifestyle choices. And um, yeah, I hope all of you uh, stay safe. Take care. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can get my email ID through the organizers, I'm sure. Or uh, uh, yeah, okay, that's it from my side. Thank you very much. Have a great day.